Hello and welcome to this January 2023 Investment Outlook video from Fidelity. I'm Ed Monk and I'm joined today by the Outlook's author Tom Stevenson to answer your questions about where Tom thinks markets are now and where they may be headed in the months ahead. Now, Tom, as always, we've asked Fidelity investors to submit their questions to you in advance, and I'm pleased to say that a great many have done just that. I'll add here that these are Tom's view of the market. It is not investment advice, but should be seen as guidance only. That said, let's put some of those questions to you now, Tom. And the first is this. Last year, there was a marked outperformance of large cap equities in the UK relative to both mid cap and small cap stocks. Are we now at the stage of the cycle where you would expect large caps to underperform small cap companies? So what's the answer? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And it's maybe something that we that we don't notice uh, very often because we tend to focus on the benchmark index, which in the in the UK, uh, obviously, is, is the FTSE 100. But but it's true that uh, the FTSE 100 has outperformed the smaller indices, the FTSE 250 and the, and the FTSE small cap by, by quite a wide margin. The FTSE 100 is, is actually pretty close to a, an all time high, yeah. whereas the FTSE 250, which is a much more domestically focused uh, index, is standing about 20 percent below its peak, which I think was struck in 2021. So, uh, so why would that be the case? Well, uh, I mean, as I say, the FTSE 250 is more domestically focused. The UK economy, as we know, is going through a, a bit of a tough time. The FTSE 100, on the other hand, is a, is a more international uh, index. It's also more exposed to some of the sectors which have done particularly well, like, um, like oil and gas. So I think as we move through 2023, um, maybe move through a recession and start to look forward to recovery, then we might expect the, the, the more cyclical FTSE 250 stocks to do better. Yeah, and, and when we talk about these kind of differences between the indices, um, what we're talking about is, is where companies derive their earnings. And it's possible to look under, underneath the bonnet, as it were, and, and see exactly which territories companies are making their money from. And as you say, the, the FTSE 100 big companies established global multinational companies, it's, it's three quarters, 70%, something like that is coming from overseas territories, even for the mid cap, um, which, as you say, is more domestic focused. But it's still true to say that about half of their earnings come from overseas territories. And I suppose the big difference, as you say, is, is the sectors in the big FTSE 100 uh, index, lots of oil in particular. It's one of the few areas of the market that did well last year at all. So that's going to show up in the, in the difference of performance, isn't it? Between yeah, these indices. I think it is. And I think it may be one thing that people are a bit puzzled about when they look at the headlines around them. They see yeah. uh, you know, how difficult the economy is. Well, why is the FTSE 100 doing so well? Well, it, it's that sector exposure and its international exposure. Indeed. OK, well, let's move on for now, Tom. The next question is this. I have been buying some select investment trusts with discounts in the belief that the discounts will reduce this year as the outlook improves. Is this a sound strategy as part of a wider portfolio? So investment trusts and discounts and the outlook for those. Yes. OK, so, so just to cover off the discount uh, question. So an investment trust uh, trades essentially like a, a share and its share price is determined by supply and demand. So there can be times when the share price of the investment trust is different from the market value of the underlying uh, investments in the investment trust. It can be lower or it can be higher. If it's lower, it's said to be trading at a discount. If it's higher, it's, mm. it's trading uh, at a premium. So um, looking at the discount or the premium makes a lot of sense as an investor, because if it is trading at a discount uh, and circumstances improve and people become more uh, optimistic, then it's possible that that uh, gap between the, the share price and the value of the underlying investments could narrow. Mm -hmm. And that will be a positive um, for the investor. Now, of course, the, the, the opposite is also true that if it's trading at a premium, then uh, uh, it might narrow in, in a different way. So um, it, the, the, the discount and the premium adds a, a degree of, um, adds, it's, an, it's an extra factor to consider yes. for, it's an added complexity complexity to investing uh, in investment trust. But, but this uh, questioner is absolutely correct. Yes, it's a good strategy to be looking to invest at a discount. Yeah, and, and investment trusts are interesting. We've spoken about them many times, Tom. And um, often, if you read a lot of commentary around this sort of stuff, they are the favoured vehicle for investing. They're basically a fund, a pooled investment, like a sort of more traditional um, fund. Yep. 
but you do have this extra complexity around it. Um, people like them because they have all sorts of advantages. We don't need to go into them all now, but it is true to say that they can add volatility for exactly this reason, that premiums and discounts can emerge, and you're never quite sure when they're going to close or widen. Yes. So I mean, if, you, if you're comfortable with that added complexity, then they do potentially uh, improve the returns, the possible returns uh, from, from the fund. But the reverse is also true. OK. OK. Well, um, let's move on for now, Tom. The next question is this. I must decide whether to invest a large lump sum into the market at the start of 2023 or whether to pound cost average over the course of the upcoming 12 months. I am mindful of the advantages of doing so, but also of the mantra that time in the market rather than timing the market is key. What would Tom's take on these options be? It is right. a good question, isn't it? You've it got is two a good conflicting question. bits of wisdom there. Yes, uh, I mean, so there's a bit more jargon to unpack there, this sort of idea of pound cost averaging. And this, this relates to the idea of dripping your money into the market, um, you know, regularly um, yeah. over time. Uh, and, and, and the advantage of doing that, over throwing your money in all in one go, is that if the market falls shortly after you invest, then that's obviously painful if you've put all of it to work uh, at the start. You tend to get a smoother ride mm. um, if you put your money in progressively um, over time. That would be my favourite approach, and that's what we tend to uh, suggest to people um, uh, make sense. And I think it particularly makes sense at the moment um, where we're not quite sure if the bear market which we uh, endured through 2022 is quite over uh, yet, may have a little bit further to go. Yeah. If that it were to be the case, then it would be helpful to put your, market, your money into the market over time because some of it would be catching investments at a, at a lower price and you'd get a better return as a result. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It, it sort of jumped out at me, this question. I mean, the, uh, the, dripping your money in, I mean, the, you, that may work in terms of an investment return, or it may not. Like you simply mm. don't know. That's just simply to do with what the market does from here and no one knows that. Mm. Um, so you're sort of, you know, you're taking a, a sort of punt either way. But as you say, the, the advantage of drip, dripping your money in is that y it's an easier ride, isn't it? You know, you don't have to worry that you've put a load of money in and it suddenly all falls in value. If, if prices do fall, great. You can just put more in, buy things more cheaply. And that's actually advantageous. Mm. Um, I can bring some personal experience to bear here. Last from from the last year, I um, I put money in in a lump sum uh, at an inopportune moment, and I've been living with that since then. It has been quite difficult to see that money lose lose mm. value in mm. the past year. It would have been better to drip it in, um, and 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 they've they've drawn this comparison with the the timing the market versus time in the market. That's true as well. You do want your money in the market as long as possible, but that's really to do with wholesale pulling money in and out of the market. Mm. Really, it's not it's not quite a a drip feed sort of question. I think it's a psychological point more mm. more than anything. I, I I think that if you put your money into the market on a regular basis, it forces you to invest and it forces you to invest maybe at times when you consider it rather difficult to invest. You know, yeah. if the market is is falling and is is low, you might not want to do that, but actually history suggests that that is precisely the time when you do want to be investing in the market. So I think the way that it takes the emotion out of investing and forces you to do it is a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on, Tom. Uh, the next question uh, is to do with bonds. We had an awful lot of questions about bonds because obviously they're widely held, but they haven't performed particularly well. Um, I've always struggled, the questioner asks, I've always struggled to understand the attraction of bonds as a diversifier, especially in the extremely low interest rate era. And so I've steered away from them. Recent history has probably proved me right, but what would be the argument in their favour now in a higher interest rate environment? Well, I mean, the answer is in the question, actually. In a, in a higher interest rate environment, then the, the yield, the income that you can earn from a bond uh, is, is higher. And indeed, uh, you can earn a much higher yield on a bond than you have been able to for, for many years. So I, I think there is quite a strong argument for, for investing in bonds uh, at the moment for, for a couple of reasons. One is that you can lock in that, that higher yield. So that's, that's, that's an attraction. The other uh, point to make is that, you know, if we do go into a more difficult time economically, 
uh, if we do head into a recession, then interest rates are not going to stay at these levels uh, yeah. indefinitely. They will probably start to come down. Uh, and uh, the price of bonds uh, moves inversely in the opposite direction uh, to, to yields. So if yields come down on the back of lower interest rates, then that will push um, prices higher. So A, you lock in a, a reasonable income and potentially you get a, a capital gain uh, as well. Yeah, and it was the case, wasn't it? It has been for many years that we, you know, the question is right. We've been in a low interest rate environment, but um, rates have always found a way to go lower, haven't they? You know, mm. they were really, really low and then they went, the pandemic came along and they went even lower. Um, and that was good kind of for, for bond prices. Um, the past year has been really bad because interest rates have gone higher. But now we're, with rates starting at this point that is elevated, mm. um, which is not to say they can't go higher, mm. but it does leave a lot of room for better performance for bonds that simply hasn't been there for, for years. Yes, and the last year actually has been an extremely unusual situation. It's quite unusual, and, and the questioner mentioned this uh, idea of diversification. It's quite unusual for bonds and shares to move in the same direction. So for them both to fall last year uh, was not was not usual. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it is entirely possible that actually they both go the opposite way uh, this year if interest rates start to come down and investors start looking forward to better times ahead, then both shares and bonds could go up. But broadly speaking, you should expect bonds and equities to move in different directions, uh, which is a good thing because it provides a smoother ride. It provides some balance and diversification. Yeah, OK. Well, uh, let's move on, Tom. Uh, the next question is this. Can you see any hope for recovery in 2023 in heavily tech-weighted funds such as Scottish Mortgage? So. Perhaps explain what Scottish Mortgage is, first of all. Yes, well, Scottish Mortgage uh, is an investment trust. Um, forget what its name, that's for, for historical, that's uh, of historical interest. It's, it's basically an investment trust that specialises in investing in these high growth, often technology uh, stocks. So as a consequence, it's done rather badly because those kinds of shares did very badly last year. One of the reasons why they did badly was that uh, interest rates were rising very quickly uh, last year and rising interest rates for technical reasons, which maybe we haven't got time to go <laughs> into now, uh, are not good for, for growth shares, for, for technology uh, shares. So coming back to my previous answer, if you think that there's a possibility that interest rates are going to start falling at some point this year, then that might actually be quite good for those technology stocks. That's the positive view. The less positive view is that those stocks became very expensive when they were very popular. And even after their falls, and some of them have fallen quite a long way, they remain quite highly uh, valued. So I think it's, quite, it's a bit of a nuanced answer. Uh, I think the outlook might get a bit better for tech stocks, but they remain uh, quite highly valued. Yeah, it's an interesting point around, around tech, isn't it? Because you've got this, this interest rate equation, which will affect their price for sure. And let's see what happens in the next year. You know, th those questions around interest rates are the big questions facing markets really mm. this year. Mm. Um, but tech in particular, it feels like it's at a bit of an inflection point. These companies are growing up. They're maturing, aren't they? They've had this incredible phase of growth. There might be more to come. People are very, they're very sure that they're going to make lots and lots of money in the years ahead. Mm. Um, but they're also, it seems, you know, uh, being affected by the normal forces that will affect companies, the, 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 the sort of economic cycle. We need to see how they perform through a real recession, which mm. is, you know, apparently what we're going to head into. A lot of tech companies are cutting staff, they're cutting costs at the moment. They're going to go through a, a sort of difficult period, but it might be a good time to get on board because they could should come out more strongly on the other side. I mean, whether that happens in the next year or so, who, who knows? But Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, if you take the view that these are long-term growth stories, they're, they're, they're companies which are reshaping the world that, that we live in, um, then you would, what, you would look for opportunities to buy them when their share prices have, have come back. That's what mm. investors do. They want to ride this long-term growth story, but to get in when the market pulls back a bit. So I, I would agree with your assessment there. Yeah. OK, well, the next question, Tom, is this. Uh, with inflation likely to trend down over 2023, what impact will this have on the UK base rate? Does Fidelity have a house view on the year end base rate? So I think that I, I think that inflation uh, is coming down. Um, I think it's coming down, you know, across the board. Um, in fact, 
um, later later this week, we've got some some figures coming out of America, which are expected to see a further decline in uh, uh, in um, in inflation. Uh, recently, we had some figures in Europe where inflation was coming down. Uh, it's also coming down in the UK, although from a much higher base, and it will probably be slower to come down here than than elsewhere. But broadly speaking, inflation is coming down. That takes pressure off the central banks to squeeze interest rates higher to to get on top of inflation. So I think in due course, um, interest rates are going to come down as a consequence of falling inflation. Yeah, and you know we've spent ages talking about this this topic over the past year, and. You know, it's important for people to understand when it comes to inflation, it, inflation might begin to come down. That doesn't mean an instant change of direction for central banks, does it? Because they have a particular job, which is to uh, to get inflation down over the longer term. And it's not just that headline rate they're going to be looking at. They're going to be looking at all sorts of other pressures in the system, particularly around wage inflation. That's yeah. why it's such a hot topic at the moment. Um, they're going to need to see not only the the headline level of inflation is lower, but that some of that demand in the economy, which is keeping wages high, wage demands high, uh, that needs to ease off as well. And that could be a painful process before we get to the stage where they're ready to actually reverse their the, the interest rate rises that we've seen. Yes, that's right. So what we may see this year is we may see interest rates stop rising. That doesn't mm. necessarily mean that they're going to immediately start start falling because the central banks are likely to want to wait and see uh, because there's always a lag between movements in interest rates and the impact on the real economy. Central banks will want to wait and see whether they've done enough. Uh, so I think you're right that inflation and interest rates remain the key focus for investors this year as they were uh, last year. But maybe it would be too optimistic to think that they're going to peak in the summer, and then immediately start falling back to a more neutral level. Okay. Okay. Well, let's move on for now, Tom. Uh, what do you think the prospects are for commodities in 2023, given that China is opening up, India is buoyant, and supply chains are easing? So that's quite a um, mm. optimistic backdrop, the questioner thinks, for yeah, commodities. Yeah, uh, it is. The thing, about, the thing about commodities is that they... Uh, they are the answer to the question about what's going on at the moment. It's not quite the same with stock markets, which tends to be the answer to the question, what's going to happen in six months Mm. or a year's time? Commodities are more focused on the here and now. And I think 2023 is going to be a year, uh, a difficult year um, for businesses, for, for, for households. And that's going to impinge on uh, demand for commodities. I mean, the question is right, you know, China is probably opening up um, from from its COVID lockdowns. Obviously, we're seeing growth in places like India. So there are, there's a two way pull here. Um, and the other thing about commodity prices is they're driven by um, longer term uh, questions about um, uh, longer term demand questions, but also longer term supply questions. How much investment has there been in uh, in um, in the supply of, of commodities? So there are lots of different moving parts, but in the short term, I think. It, uh, commodities will focus on what's going on in the economy, and that's going to be a bit tough this year. And of course, many of them did rise in price, so we're starting at a higher valuation this, this time. Yeah, we have, although they many of them have come down quite a long way. I mean, the oil prices has come down quite a long way. Some of the industrial metals like copper uh, ha- also fell um, last year. But yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's going to be a We've got to get through 2023, I think, before we can look at really a a sustainable rise in commodity prices. Okay. well, the next question, Tom, is this. This is reflective of many questions that we got. I could have picked one of half a dozen or more uh, basically asking the same thing. And it is this. With rising interest rates and considering my age, which is 78, the question says, would I be better switching to fixed rate cash savings accounts? So cash savings versus the stock market? Well, for the first time in many years, there are alternatives uh, to, to the stock market. Bonds are offering a, uh, a, a yield and income, as we discussed earlier on. Cash is also uh, offering a return, which it hasn't for, for, for many years. I mean, for many years, we've said, yes, you should have some cash because it's dry powder in case the market falls a bit. Uh, it provides a bit of diversification. But in mm. terms of income, you're going to be losing money in real in inflation-adjusted terms. 
That's probably still true. In inflation adjusted yes. terms, you will be losing money with cash. But many people, and particularly if you're 78, you may look and think, well, if I can lock my money in for a couple of years and get three or four percent mm, with no risk, yeah. that's, that seems quite attractive. It may look less attractive at the end of this year if the market does start improving and you know, maybe you get a you know, seven, eight, ten percent return in the stock market, then a three, four percent return on cash looks uh, less impressive. But I do understand the attraction, yeah. uh, especially to an older investor, um, of that security. Yeah, I mean, what occurred to me about this question is that it really reminds us all to get get a clear idea of what we want our money to be doing for us. And that does relate to our circumstances, yeah. like our age and, and how long we're going to be invested and when we might want the money. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, as you say, if if you know cash is offering for, it's, it's slightly more than you know it could be four percent over a year or two years but mm. it might be four and a half if mm. you're willing to tie your money up for longer than that um you've got to think about the opportunity cost now you've got to be quite bullish about the stock market to think well it's going to be significantly above four five percent this year um, to justify the risk that you're taking. Because, of mm. course, with investments, there's the risk that your money will lose value. That doesn't exist for cash, at least not, not in uh, uh, cash terms. Mm. You, you can't lose, you lose value. So it, it's, it's an understandable question, but really you need to understand you know, what you, you want your money to do. Have cash, for sure, but don't, don't you know, ignore the stock market because that's still going to be the driver for growth in the long term. Yeah, and it's not either or, is it? I mean, no. you can have both. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's important. And indeed, you would probably want to have both, just as you would want to have some bonds and you know, maybe some other assets as well in a diversified portfolio. Indeed, indeed. Well, let's move on for now, Tom. Uh, why has goals, the questioner asked, why has goals shown the poorest return of all my investments when I understood that it would be a safe haven in difficult times? Do you see this investment improving? So, gold. Well, I mean, interestingly, I think gold actually performed uh, its role in 2022 as a bit of a diversifier. Because I'm, su I'm slightly surprised to hear the, the, the question because actually, I think gold, gold was pretty flat over the mm. year as a whole in 2022. Many stock markets performed rather bad. I mean, the US stock market was down nearly, nearly 20% last year. So, actually, to have some gold in your portfolio was, was a good thing. Now, the value of gold is determined by many factors, one of which is uh, inflation and in particular the relationship between inflation and uh, interest rates. If interest rates are, are high uh, and you can earn an income from assets like bonds and from cash, then the attraction of holding gold reduces because gold doesn't mm. doesn't pay an income. Um, so as interest rates come down, um, as inflation comes down, then the attraction of gold probably increases because then the opportunity cost of holding gold with no income is less of a problem. Yeah, and, and, and it, it's a lesson, isn't it, about the sort of assuming that particular assets always behave the same way in every sort of you know, set of conditions. Mm. It's not true. I mean, gold has held its value in inflation terms mm. um, over very long periods. There's all mm. sorts of ways you can show that. But short term, it's way less simple than that, isn't it? I mean, mm. as you say, there can be all sorts of other factors going on at the same time. And gold can be a good diversifier to hold in the long term, but don't look to it to, to sort of perform exactly as you expect all the time. No, and, and don't necessarily look to it as, as a performance-related asset. Maybe the, it's the diversification, uh, which is the real attraction. Okay, well, the next question, Tom, is this bit of a long one, but a very interesting, interesting one, I think. Uh, it is this. I have, been invest I have been investing with Fidelity for a number of years, but consider myself a novice. Consequently, I'm very grateful for Tom's picks and have tended to buy two or three of them each year. As Tom tends to stick with his picks for the long term, I am now building up a sizable portfolio of them. 20 so far. Wow. My concern is that this may become too unwieldy. Should I be concerned? And if so, how should I go about the tricky business of selecting which of Tom's picks to sell? Mm. So a dedicated follower <laughs> of you there, Tom. Well, um, what would you say about holding many, many funds and how should you prune along the way? Well, it, it raises an interesting question and it's something that we all suffer from as investors is that we will tend to, we will tend to buy 
buy funds, buy investments, and then buy some more, and, and it just builds and builds and builds, and it becomes a bit flabby, a bit unfocused. We don't really know what's there anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is there is merit in in periodically assessing what you've got because there's probably quite a lot of overlap yeah. between funds. They might be doing similar things. So uh, so th- that's what I would suggest. The, the questioner does. As for myself, I will take that as a prompt um, to go and have a look at the the, the, the fun picks yeah. from, from recent years. I think that would be a really useful exercise uh, to go and have a look and, and just maybe reassess what our view is on some of the longer standing yeah. picks. Yeah, and it's, it's important to say, isn't it? I mean, I don't want to speak for you, Tom, but you know, the picks that you come up with each year, they're a, they're a sort of, they're a reflection of where you think the growth in the market might be. It's not to say only old, hold those funds there should be probably funds that you hold mm. outside of that mm. um, so it's not necessarily a problem that this investor is hanging on to them for year after year probably you shouldn't make an investment unless you yeah. uh, uh, intend to hold it for many years 20 probably is too many you're probably like to likely to suffer a problem that people call over um, diversification yeah. you know you're, you're yeah. sort of um, diversification you're, diversification yeah, yeah. You're, you're basically holding Lots of funds that actually, it sort of everything becomes a bit brown at the end of it. You know, yeah. it's all mixed up, and probably you're overpaying. There might be a simpler and a cheaper way mm-hmm. of getting the same effect. So it is worth pruning. Um, but one thing that people can do is look at the the holdings as as far as they can within their funds, particularly the geographical regions, the assets that are being held, to make sure that you're not building up too much of any one thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there probably is overlap, but but I think there's an action for me there. So thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Tom, we're going to have the last question today. An interesting one, uh, and one that might take a bit of um, caveating, but I'll do that. The question is simple. It says, is now the time to be, to be investing in Bitcoin and Ethereum? <laughs> These are cryptocurrencies. And um, I'm going to say here that we're not going to take a view about... Uh, overall the sort of outlook for the prices of these assets. But I thought it would be interesting to include a question like this um, because uh, crypto is such a high profile uh, sort of force within financial, uh, sort of the financial arena right now. What would you have to say about that for people who might be interested in crypto? Well, what I'd say is that um, cryptocurrencies have have been a very disappointing uh, investment over the last year. They have fallen back uh, a long way. Um, so, you know, you know, by definition, they perhaps look more interesting at this lower level than they did uh, at the yeah. higher level. But I have to say that I don't know um, what the outlook is for these for these cryptocurrencies. I would say that I personally will not be uh, investing in them. Um, I, I, I don't. That, that's not a that's not a commentary, by the way, on the future of um, yeah. um, uh, these kinds of um, alternative. Uh, currencies. Um, I simply don't know. But it's just, for me, it's risky. Um, I think that there are plenty of opportunities in the stock market, in bonds, in in in, in other assets f- for me. But that's yeah. just, that's a personal view. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting area. Isn't it? Look, I mean, crypto has grown up a lot in the past uh, few years. Definitely, it's, it's the case that they're going to be here to stay in some form or other. But what we're waiting for, I think, is to see exactly what kind of role they're going to play for ordinary investors, I mean, mm-hmm. sure, people are going to speculate on them and people have made lot fortunes on crypto and they've lost fortunes mm-hmm. as well. But for the ordinary investor who's looking to invest for the long term, they may well have a place, but it's likely to be at the margins, isn't it? I mean, if you, you just have to look at the volatility of these assets, yeah. um, you, you know, they, they probably perform in the same way that a, a single company share might perform mm-hmm. and quite a volatile one at that. Mm-hmm. And you would never put all your money into just a, a single company share. So. Sure, take a look, form your own view, but be wary of, of, of wholesale backing one of these things. Right? Yeah, and as you say, a small part of an overall portfolio, very small part. Indeed. Okay. Well, Tom, that is all the time that we have for questions now. Uh, thanks to Tom for joining us to answer those questions. If you've asked us a question that we didn't get round to, uh, we have a special edition of the Personal Investor Podcast this week, which will answer yet more of them. You can listen to that on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. A full copy of Tom's Investment Outlook is also available to download at fidelity.co.uk forward slash Outlook. Thank you so much for watching and do join us again next time. Bye for now.